What's going on? It's Quaz from the Running River Collective. You're tuning in to a conversation I had with a bright young man who's looking to create a difference in his world. What's going on, everybody? It's Quasi from the Running River Collective. Today I have a special guest. He's the founder of Rising Black Men, an organization that looks to raise up black men in predominantly white institutes and college. He's also the founder of Uplift, which is a similar organization that focuses on the black community um, in a predominantly white institute for both genders. He's also a master's student at UPenn, and he is one half of the podcast Gumption, a podcast that focuses on raising the, the awareness and excellency of black men. Ladies and gentlemen, Timothy Hurd. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate the introduction, man. It made me feel like a star. Man, listen, let me tell you, Tim, you are a star, man. And and just being able to see you over uh, these past few years, from when you started college to when you graduated college, to you move into your master's program, from all the different organizations you've not only been a part of, but created, is super, super impressive. It is really impressive. And I'm really uh, honored and grateful that you took some time just to sit and talk with me about um, all things uh, Black in the context of this Juneteenth celebration that's coming up. Mm. No doubt. Yeah, absolutely, man. I appreciate you for extending the invitation. Um, and because it's obviously, you know, uh, family and talking to my cousin, it was to be a great conversation, but then also touching on this subject and because Juneteenth is literally two days away, um, really less than a day, um, just touching on the subject and, um, you know, addressing some things that come with Juneteenth is, I think, important. Mm -hmm. Now, Tim, um, we're both from the Midwest, Michigan. I'm from Saginaw, you're from Detroit. And, you know, growing up, our history books did not tell us a lot about Juneteenth. Um, it's a holiday I wasn't even aware of until I became an adult. Um, what's it been like for you coming into this realization of what Juneteenth means for mm -hmm. the community as general in general? And also, what does it mean for you uh, this holiday? Yeah, um, this holiday, I've actually been like learning as we go. So it's still so much about um, Juneteenth I don't know, but I guess like the foundation is just um, happening like Galveston, Texas, and the soldier came and was like, hey, y'all are free, but it was like two years after. Um, so I don't know, this whole day of like Juneteenth, I never heard about it in class because um, I'm originally from Detroit, but I moved to Gross Point um, my fifth grade year, so I was 12 years old. And um, I didn't hear anything about Juneteenth when I went to DPS schools, and I certainly didn't hear anything about Juneteenth um, in the predominantly white suburban area that I now live in and have lived in for the last 11 years. It just wasn't a topic of discussion. Um, so I really didn't hear about Juneteenth until I got to college. And it was still outside of the classroom there. So I never was in a necessarily formal setting when I heard about Juneteenth and when people were educating me on it. Yeah, it's very interesting how um, we have to super go out of our way to, to, to find our history. The, um, it's not very accessible in terms of the books. Uh, it's, it's, it's even hard to read about more. It's easier now than it was before. Um, and it's just something that doesn't get talked about a lot, uh, like, you, like you touched on in, in Galveston, Texas, when the, the last slaves were free. Uh, slavery had been abolished in America for two years, but it wasn't until um, uh, Juneteenth, I think it was 1868, correct me if I'm wrong, that they were actually, the, the final slaves were free. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Yeah, I just, I don't know, just, I don't know, I'm just, cause like I, cause you said 1868, I heard it was like 1865. Right. Um, so like, I don't know, just, I don't know, it's just like, and then I guess how you introduced it when you were talking about um, like what it means to be free um, instead of some per a person relinquishing um, the power of you, um, but how that like kind of correlates to being free and how that is a type of freedom, but um, also like what is like, you know, being free on the inside. Um, yeah. So yeah, it made me think about that as well. 
Wow, that's an interesting point, like being free on the inside, because um, I don't know, I'm, I'm a bit bittersweet about the holiday itself, because, you know, as you know, there's so much going on in terms of racial disparity. Yep. I, it hardly feels like a time to celebrate a freedom that does not uh, feel like it's, it's really here. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I guess in terms of just like a freedom that that isn't here um i'm gonna take you back to really around this well about so today is june 17th so 16 days ago um over well 90 well about 100 years ago um in tulsa uh, mm. there was the the black wall street in, in oklahoma and how there was an establishment of you know black people who in a way were free they were free because they were self-sustained. Um, they were self-sufficient. They didn't rely on anybody. They had their own community, their own businesses, their own banks, um, their own hospitals. And they had all this, this, this stuff that really translated into a thriving self commit or a thriving um, independent community. And you had people come in and, and bomb it. Um, off of an accusation of a, of a, of a 17 year old, I believe, um, sexually assaulting a, a 16 year old white woman, a 17 year old black boy, and you know, them taking him to the, uh, to the courthouse and talking about, you know, lynching him and um, using this as an excuse um, to go in what they call a riot, but I call it a massacre because I was just doing my research on it. And they were talking about how there's been, they said originally it was only like three white men who were killed. Um, but if later came to be found out that there were over 300 people, um, black people who were killed and like thrown into the river and like they never got proper burial and just like the lives that were taken uh, from a people who had granted this is 1921 so if we're talking about Juneteenth this is like less than 60 years about 60 years we moved from June from Juneteenth the original Juneteenth and you talk about what we expected when we when we got off of the plantation and being able to have our own land and have our own space and we got that in Tulsa, Oklahoma, right? And that's that's power because it's it we, we came so far so fast and it just also showed the resiliency of, of, of the black person, of, of of the you know, uh people who originated from Africa and um it just showed how, how we can make something out of nothing, how we've always been able to make something out of nothing. But then it also shows, um, you know, when, whenever there's any upward mobilization of black people as a whole, how, how it's seen as a threat mm -hmm. to the ideas and the foundation of American society, American democracy. So it's put out. It's like, well, there's a fire burning and, and they got to come and, and spit on the fire and stump on the fire and, and I guess just updating and the reason that I mentioned that story is because at that point we were free and they were able to build up, you know, after, because like I said, black people were resilient, but it was never to the caliber of how it was pre June 1st of 1921. But just fast tracking that to right now and with everything going on and this, the, the momentum of black lives matter and encompassing all black lives matter and everything that's going on with that. And you still have people out here who don't believe in our freedom, don't believe in our existence, still think that we're enslaved. And one of the things that, that I've been um, kind of conditioning myself to do is say we were enslaved, we weren't slaves, because mm -hmm. um, that, that isn't who we are. You know, people, mm -hmm. they brought us over here and they enslaved us, but we aren't slaves. We were just enslaved because on the inside, you know, um, just, just having that autonomy over your own body and, and, and wanting to feel free, even if you weren't physically free. Um, but, but bringing it back to, to today, um, and in two days, um, our president um, of, the, of, the, of the free world, the, the quote unquote supposed, supposed to be leader of the free world, is supposed to be coming to Tulsa, Oklahoma, where Black Wall Street was created and where Black Wall Street burned. And it's supposed to give a, a Trump rally and this is the man whose rhetoric is dividing the country and it's really peeling back that that hidden veil on white supremacy and what it means to be a post-racial society 
Um, so it is really bringing that to the forefront and saying that, look, we have some problems and we have a lot of issues that we need to address. Just because we elected President Obama, like Mitch McConnell just said a couple of days ago, doesn't mean that, you know, we've made up for slavery is, oh. is in his words. And, you know, for me, it's so infuriating because that's a slap in the face because you want to talk about a time that we were free and a time that we had our own and it was burned down. And the same ideals that were perpetuated right now manifest into the mind of the person who's supposed to be leading our country. And he's spewing out all this stuff because he doesn't care. And he talks about black people and people out here and who are rioting when in a way it's been just through social media and just through my own research, there've been people who've been paid and, and white people were coming in and looting and, and doing this stuff, but them not taking any of the blame, but them being, you know, vigilantes and all these terrible people, but the same people who come up to the state capitol, my state capitol in, in, in Michigan, holding AR-15s, they're good people, right? And, and people who go to Pennsylvania with AR-15s, these white men, they're good people. If black people would have did that, you know how fast, like, the, the special forces would be there and, you know, like, yo, like somebody wouldn't make it out of there alive if that was a group of black people storming the capitol with AR-15s. But you have the same president who approves this is, is is going to Tulsa on on a day that's supposed to be of uh, empowerment, uh, a day where we, we get our autonomy back, quote unquote, in mm -hmm. a day where we're supposed to have a piece of freedom and he's coming and he's going to a site where people were free and where that was burned down and just holding a rally. And for me, I just can't wrap my mind around it. It just, it seems like very hypocritical and it is, yeah, I, I can't even, I don't even have the words to describe it. Yeah. And, and while we're mentioning Tulsa, I mean, just the thought came to me too, that I believe it's either um, the 16th or the 18th. I, I'll be able to I'll be sure to double check it, but mm -hmm. I believe it is the 16th um, mm -hmm. when uh, George Stenny Jr. in 1944 was the youngest person ever to uh, receive the death penalty. 14 year old yep. black boy, yeah, um, accused of a crime with with far 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 from you from any kind of fair trial. Mm -hmm. And just to hear you talk about the trauma that lives in the soil, you know, that we still we still walk to this day. You know, even in our home state of Michigan, to see to see it being reenacted in front of us to be constantly reminded, to be constantly seen um, and told that we're slaves. When you so excellently put it, we're not slaves, we were enslaved. Right. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's honestly infuriating and it doesn't feel like it's any time to celebrate. Um, the government's got, got people in the protest and it's not funny, but it's kind of funny how, you know, if you think about maybe the riots that happened um, in the 60s and the 70s, you know, there's no camera phones, you know? Mm -hmm. So some of these tactics that they use in the 60s and the 70s, they can't, can't get away with. We got cameras like, we, hey, we see you right. over there acting a fool. Mm -hmm. um, but, but what you touched, about, touched on about, you know, every time we seem to get some upward momentum, there's an insecurity in America. Uh, right. In America, insecure to see us doing better, and they have to constantly remind us um about the the stage they set mm -hmm. uh, and it's um i am hoping that this juneteenth as much as we need a release we also continue to fight um right. and, and and some of that fight does have to look like love and i'm not talking about the love where we have to um support our oppressors but more of a love within our communities because right. uh, unfortunately as you well know as well there's still a lot of um, transphobia, a lot of homophobia. Yeah. There's a lot of uh, sexism that still needs to be addressed uh, as for everybody, you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, in order to see the whole entire world really be able to um, stand in this way of peace. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wanted to ask you because uh, for those that don't know, and they'll sure find out once they follow you on all the places that they can follow you, you are, uh, from what it seems, someone that has an unlimited amount of energy and, <laughs> and an extreme wealth of joy. Um, 
I've really enjoyed catching on Instagram dancing, um, dance in the kitchen. You've been able to get your whole family to dance. You know, <laughs> and it, seem, it really seems like when you're in spaces with people, they're able to free themselves up a bit. They're able to let their guard down. They're able to show some vulnerability. And um, it's just amazing. How, how do you get that to happen? How do you do that? Yeah, man. <laughs> that's a great question. Um, because it wasn't always that way. Because growing up, like, I don't know, um, re I was relatively shy. Um, I was actually pretty shy, man. And uh, it wasn't really until I got to college, really, probably like my freshman year when I started to, you know, I was my first, quote unquote, independence out the house. Um, and it was the first time I, I was able to to learn about myself, um, to just even going back to, I guess, the, you know, realness into the topic of Juneteenth. Um, I had, I felt trapped in my mind um, for, for so long. And especially growing up here in Gross Point, because, you know, I, I felt like I encountered racism in the fifth grade, the second day of school. It, it's very vivid, you know, it's certain things like that you never forget. And um, just dealing with racism and dealing with microaggressions and yeah. just dealing with all of this uh, stuff that comes with being the only black male in spaces it, as a young kid. So internalizing a lot of things. And like when I was younger, like, you know, I didn't fit in. And for me, I was so stubborn, I didn't try to fit in. So I was like, whatever, man, y'all not gonna accept me. I'm gonna do my own thing. <laughs> and I think that kind of stuck with me, um, that, that stubbornness, because even when I got to college, like, and I was like, I wanna hang around black people, and it's gonna be everything black, black, black. I don't wanna see no white people. Even though I'm going to a predominantly white institute, I don't even wanna see no white people. I wanna be around them. I don't wanna be around black people. And I, and, you know, I achieved that goal uh, my freshman year. I was good to go outside of class. Um, but even then, I saw, like, yo, like, just because you black and, I, and I'm black don't mean that we're going to be best of friends and we're going to automatically connect and stuff like that. And for me, that's when I was, like, reminded of living back, on the, living back in Detroit on the east side. And I was like, yo, I had, you know, friends – who would like, we happen to live in an all black neighborhood. I'm like, I got friends who black, but I also, you know, have some people who black who I'm not necessarily friends with because they just mean people and they don't like me. And for me, my dad always told me people are people regardless of race, but um, it, it, it's kind of hard to actually look at that from an objective view when you're 12 years old and you're the only black kid in the space. And a lot of people's introduction to blackness so they're coming up to me with all these microaggressions and all this stuff. I don't know who's racist. I don't know who's ignorant. I don't know who's who's who. I just know everybody's white. So mm -hmm. for me, it's like, all right, how am I about to navigate this, right? But once I got to college, I was able to, I had the experience of white people. And, and you know, I met a couple of good white people here and there um, during my time in Girls Point. And I was like, hey, man, like I had dealt with both sides. So I saw how it felt to be the only black person. I saw how it felt to... Um, feel like an outsider in a way of like, because a lot of the kids who came there came from Detroit and I hadn't been around like people from Detroit or, you know, some of my older friends in like nine, 10 years. So it had been a minute. Um, it had been a second. And it's just like, yo, like, welcome back. But uh, OK, this is let me get you up to date. This is what it is. Um, so just seeing like the divisiveness within our within our own community and some of the stuff that we went through, which was the catalyst for me, you know, creating my organization, because like I said, me being so stubborn, um, I was cool with not fitting in. I was cool with being an outsider. I felt like I was always the outsider. So I just started to own that, like, hey, I'm an outsider or, you know, I'm different and I'm going to embrace being different. And the more I embraced it, the more people gravitated towards it because they were like, yo, it's genuine. It's authentic. You're not trying to follow a trend and stuff. Mm -hmm. So by the time I created my organization, um, our first conversation, our very first conversation was how to navigate a predominantly white institute um, while dealing with um, microaggressions, but then also the crab in a barrel effect. It's like things that were going on in our own community. For instance, um, the majority of students who come to Michigan State from Detroit, um, go to two main feeder schools, and that's Cast Tech and that's Renaissance. And you even have the divisiveness within this in terms of like, oh, Cast Tech, we're the best school in the city, not Renaissance, we're the best school. So it's like, you know, it's cute rivalry and everything, um, and it's entertaining, but if you take that same energy to 
a place where there's 50,000 students and you less than 2% of the population, there's only so many of us. So some people take that to heart. And it's like, I'm not going to talk to you because you know, you went to this school, but it's like we need each other. And then even on a deeper level than that, people isolating other people because, oh, you quote unquote talk white or you think you smart or you think you too cool, right? And you talk about like homophobia and transphobia. If that person's gay, ugh, don't talk to them, you know, or if that person's trans, let alone like, oh, if that person's a transsexual and it's like, what, what, what is this? Like, what are you doing and stuff? So like growing up, these are things that I heard. These are things that I still hear on occasion. And, you know, that's within our own community. So the, just having those conversations and it's like, you know, you have to have it. And um, for me, it was it was so therapeutic being in a space after I was able to create it full of black right. men and we were able to touch on subjects like that because you saw where people's viewpoints was, but it was also open space and it was non-judgmental because we was like, we're not coming here politically correct. Like we're going to come in here and we're going to speak from the heart. That that not being not being politically correct, not mean being that we're not going to respect people. So we'll respect you if you identify as their them pronouns or if you identify within the LGBTQ plus spectrum. We'll definitely respect you and what you bring to the table. Um, but politically correct in terms of like, yo, I'm gonna say how I feel about my experience here at Michigan State and how I felt about these white people or how I felt about other black people who were clowning me or this this person and that person. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna speak from the far heart and, and, and let you know how I really feel. And this is how I'm coming. And being able to have conversations where people just felt comfortable enough because they felt empowered by one another and they felt uplifted by one another. And it all came back to what you talked about in terms of love in our own community. And that love in our own community being you know, self-sustaining. But it comes back to, you know, we got to take ourselves serious. And, and in a way, I, I would say that we do because there's so many people that I know who, who are on it, like yourself um, and like other people that I know who are just out here, change agents and stuff. But we don't often get highlighted as much. You know, people like to highlight the negative and a person who's doing this and that all crazy. But there's so many people out here who are doing some dope things too. Uh, and I think one of the things is just continue to highlight people um, who are in this space where we are doing dope things like yourself and and like me and, and and so many other people who are black millennials out here, Generation Z just doing it and and, and really having these discussions and, and being inclusive. So when we talk about black lives matter, talking about all lives matter. So all lives that, that identify as black under the spectrum and, and being able to, you know, uplift everybody and, and talking about, you know, this, this rape culture or this hyper masculinity that we have in certain areas and in certain communities, because hyper masculinity is not just a black issue. It's an, it's an issue amongst people who identify as males in any ethnicity, in any creed, in any color. But since we're talking about black people because we identify under the African diaspora and we identify with this African heritage and ancestry, it's an issue that we need to address within our community. So, you know, people who are willing to speak up and feel empowered to, and for me, like I said, I feel empowered to and willing to speak up just because of my experiences being an outcast and an outsider and becoming cool and comfortable because when you're an outsider and outcast, you ain't got a lot of people to talk to. You got to talk to yourself, you know what I'm saying? So you become cool and comfortable in your own skin and talking to yourself. And in that, you know, you you, you find a deeper meaning of, of who you are and, and you're also able to feel, you know, learn more about yourself and what you like. And when you know yourself, you're unstoppable because you know your triggers, you know, you know what gets you up, you know what continues to motivate you. And when you know yourself, you you win in that life because can't nobody touch you then, no matter what anybody says. Because mm -hmm. you're gonna have that tunnel vision of like, yo, I know myself, I didn't did so much reflection, I know where I'm headed, nothing's gonna stop me, period. And I'm gonna keep going. Yes. Yes. And I, I it sounds, you know, being that you were the first person in uh, a lot of the spaces you occupy to um, create room for people to be vulnerable, to create room for people to have unpopular opinions but still feel respected, for people to sometimes be the margin, more marginalized group within an already marginalized group to still feel comfortable to come into that space. Uh, it sounds like it took a lot of personal work to be comfortable enough in your own skin to um, create that space for others. Yeah. How, how did you uh, take that leap of faith to really yeah. embrace your individuality? 
Yeah, with 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 us, I would be lying if I said it was a it was a straight shot. With with every step, there was a stumble. It was like a wet spot, so I kept slipping. Um, but one of the things that I that I preach now is just failing forward. So there were many times, especially freshman year, I was like, you know what, I'm gonna go do this, and I would have some of my friends be like, why you you why are you doing that? You that's for white people. You can't do this or you know. Um, when I was even thought, talking about getting into research, why are you going to do research? So I, and I would kind of feel frustrated. I'd be like, dang, like, well, maybe I can't do research. Maybe they ain't right or whatever. But then I went back to my whole time in Gross Point and I used something that was a, a challenge and negative um, to, to, to play in my favor. And I was like, hey, people said in Gross Point I wasn't going to do this and that because I was black. Did I listen to them? No. Am I at Michigan State? Yes. So for me, that was empowering whenever I was slipped. But there definitely would be times where, you know, I would try to come out of my shell. And like I said, I was shy. Um, so when I would try to speak to people, I would, it, it, it was like, man, should I go up and talk to this person? Nah, because they might think this and that. But when I was able to get outside of my own head, um, man, the doors opened up. You know, life started flourishing. Like things started just working out because I was able to take all the negative and all of that, you know, that, that stuff that I had stored up that was in my head and, and you know, renting and, and rent free in my head, um, yeah. I was able to evict it, you know, and, and release um, and kind of free myself from my inner thoughts um, because that was, that was something that, that kept me trapped, um, that kept me confined. Um, and it kept me from, it kept me limiting um, my potential. And, you know, for me, I just wanted to tap in. People were like, tap in with me. I just wanted to tap in with myself wow. and tap in with my own potential. So when I was able to do that, yeah, I slipped and failed, but it was about that perspective, that change in perspective. And, and thankfully, having great parents um, and coming from a rather optimistic household, um, I just, you know, took some things that I liked about what my parents did in terms of, you know, hurt, um, dark situations or negative situations and use humor um, and also optimism to get through it in prayer as well. And, and that's when my relationship with God, like, um, it, it increased tenfold. Like it, it just flew it skyrocketed. And, and that was like the foundation for everything, um, that blossomed from there. So, wow. yeah. Well, Tim, you sound like a wise, thoughtful <laughs> brother. What? And I know you're doing the work and we appreciate it. Um, I appreciate it. We all appreciate it. What's, what are some ways that you would like to, to speak to the black community and specifically um, the men in the black community who, who are hurting, who mm -hmm. are suffering from the trauma that we've all been suffering from for 400 years, who haven't had an opportunity to be vulnerable and, and maybe address some of the sexism, some of the homophobia, some of of all the different things that we need to um, get out in the open and, and, and de-violence, I guess I would say. Like, um, what what would be some ways that you, what would you like to say to them? Yeah, I would probably say, man, that's a great question. Um, for guys who are hurting, for guys who are, are going through it and are in difficult situations, um, man, I would say the best thing to do is I mean, everybody is different, but for me, one of the one of the things, because I don't want to group everybody together, because uh, I know we're not a monolith and people respond differently to different ways. But one of the things that I would say is just like, you know, speak out your feelings. Um, you know, write it down. Um, journal. I know that's not a big thing, or that might be seen as quote unquote feminine, or oh man, don't journal and this and that, man. Get out of this box of confining yourself to this. Well, to get out of the man box, what I taught for my for my class that the class that I taught at Michigan State um, last semester, and we masculinity, fraternity, and leadership. Um, getting out of the man the man box and not necessarily being the sturdy oak or the person who has to always hold things together and and act like you're tough and, and when mentally you're you're suffering but you're you're trying to keep it together because you don't want to be seen as weak or because you have people to support but it's okay to have emotional intelligence so for me you know writing things down and journaling on a day daily on a daily basis allow me to develop my my emotional intelligence and and articulate my thoughts and my feelings and 
for me, that was, man, that was uh, life changing because I was able to get everything out and not hold it in. Because if you hold things in, you know, that accumulates and um, it, it, it can be a, something small and it goes back to knowing thyself, you know, you have a trigger and next thing you know, you're erupting on everybody and you're, you're, you're hurting people and you're really hurting people. And, you know, you keep that energy in and you need to let it out. You need to let it out. Um, Cause it'll help you. It'll help you feel freer. It'll help you with joy. It, I, I think it is just, just help. But um, it, it starts with the mind. Um, everything is mental. Well, uh, mm. My coach used to say it was like 92% mental, 90% mental, 10% physical. So it starts up here and what you think about yourself and, and where you're at. And, and don't be trapped up here. Um, so the biggest way I would say is just journal. Write out your feelings. And, you know, if anybody would be, you know, follow up with that or, you know, I would love to follow up with people if they actually took that advice and, you know, started to journal and just articulate their feelings and, you know what I'm saying, just, just start something from there because I think that's powerful in itself. For sure. For sure. We didn't start out this way. And um, yeah. trying is definitely the first step, getting past that illusion that mm -hmm. you have to be this way. And um, unboxing yourself is big. It's big. On Tupac's birthday, no less. You know, yeah. journal it out. Um, yeah. There's room for that. Uh, Tim, I want to I want to thank you for taking the time. Um, I want to thank you for all the work you're doing for the black community. I want to thank you for not giving up on us. Um, I know you're you know you're doing good things in academia. I know you're gonna go far, and I, and I just I'm glad you didn't forget about you know, everybody, you know, and then um, you're real, you're authentic, and it, and it definitely comes across, man. Thank you. Thank you for everything you're doing. Thank you, man. Likewise, I appreciate everything. Thanks for continuing to inspire me to just be myself, man. Um, shoot, and embrace myself and be confident in myself, so. You that dude, man. You that dude. <laughs> That's all you. <laughs> right on, man. Well, I guess we're gonna sign off. Is there any is there any last words or you want us to find you anywhere? Um, sure, man. Yeah. Um, you can follow me um uh, on Instagram. I follow back. I promise. Uh I got the same amount of followers as I am following pretty much. Um, so uh it's Tim T I M J Hurd H E R D. Um, so it's my my name. And then follow the podcast if you don't do anything, just for some more good, you know, word. Um, some high energy, a lot of love, um, and just a lot of freedom, man. A, a lot of joy uh, through the airways. If you want that, um, please follow follow me um, and, and my podcast mate um, on Gumption G U M P T U T -T, T T I O N. So I'm gonna spell it again: G U M P T T I O N. So you can follow us on Instagram. Um, you can also follow us on Facebook and you can find us on any podcast where podcasts are available. Let it up, man. Power to the people, my guy. Power to the people, my guy. All right, we out. All right.